Okay, welcome to Monsterology. Uh, in this episode, we're going to look at something uniquely American, namely Bigfoot. I can't very well have a Monsterology channel and not take on Bigfoot, Sasquatch, the gentle, gentle uh, woodland ape, as it were. Um, there are still um, hundreds of sightings and reports of Bigfoot in the Pacific Northwest. And so we're going to create a number of interesting Bigfoot related images. And these are sort of narrative images that tell the story or convey some of the story. It's more interesting than you might imagine. Um, just as some people might look at the zombie apocalypse as a kind of theoretical test case for thinking about things like pandemics and the sort of rupture of political and economic um, stability. So too, uh, Bigfoot is an interesting uh, case study, kind of theoretical uh, case study for thinking about evolution. And so it's more interesting than you might imagine at first blush, unless of course you're already a Bigfoot fan, then you're gonna love it. All right, here comes Bigfoot. This is the first drawing that I came up with. This is really a uh, drawing of a creature that really did live during the Pleistocene era called Gigantopithecus. And it was, you know, around, they figure it was between nine and 12 feet tall. And it was, as you can see from the drawing here, it was, it was from the family of orangutans. So our contemporary orangutan is in the same basic family group as this giant creature. We don't know exactly what this thing looked like because we have parts of a jaw, parts of the body and teeth, but we can sort of reasonably assume that it had some of the qualities of contemporary uh, orangutans. And it was obviously massive. One suggestion is that this thing, which um, was alive during the time of uh, our cousins, the hominids, and even uh, seems to have lived uh, all the way up to, to maybe 300,000 years ago. Therefore, it would have actually had some contact with Homo erectus in Asia. This thing probably originated two million years ago. And despite its sort of horrifying visage in this uh, drawing I'm doing, it was a herbivore and probably ate uh, a similar diet and in a similar fashion uh, as uh, today's pandas. You see what I'm doing here is I did the sketch with pencil and then I'm using a quill pen and dipping it in India ink and then basically just uh, give it, getting all that really nice line work that, that makes a very dramatic uh, sort of image. There's some cr cross hatching going on here and I'm trying to sort of give some feel to the form and some three-dimensionality to it. I'm really trying to capture the emotional quality too and the flow of the, the long hair. As you know, the orangutans have this kind of long golden or brown reddish hair. Um, this is a little tricky on the, the sort of paper I'm using here because this is a kind of mixed media paper. It's kind of uh, grainy and has a lot of uh, tooth to it. So it's a little difficult to drag the um, the quill pen through it in a smooth fashion. What you really want to do is use a really uh, smooth paper for this kind of drawing. But I do like the way it's turning out. Um, I've taped it off here so that I can do another image below it. And my goal as I'm doing this, I'm sort of thinking, well, how should I add color? And I hatch this plan to sort of go into it with acrylics and with um, watercolors. And that's what you see me doing here. I'm laying in a wash of watercolor uh, and in some cases I've just got really watered down acrylic and I'm just playing with this to see if I can build up some of the color but I want to keep my 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 sort of color choices and values kind of limited and uh, controlled uh, anyway this thing uh, as I said was is basically considered to be a one of the contenders for Bigfoot the, the idea is maybe this thing came across the Bering land bridge uh, thousands of years ago possibly, you know, half a million years ago, and then it took up residency somewhere in the Pacific Northwest or somewhere in the Americas. Um, there's not a lot of evidence, just like there's not a lot of evidence 
for Bigfoot generally, that this could be true, but at least as a contender theory, it, uh, it, it has some sense to it. Uh, basically, uh, Grover Krantz and Jeffrey Bourne uh, argued that uh, Bigfoot is a Gigantopithecus population or some kind of descendant. Maybe Bigfoot shares a common ancestor with Gigantopithecus. And uh, Krantz was an American anthropologist, cryptozoologist who, who died in 2002. And he did a lot of stuff on Bigfoot. He was often ridiculed. Um, and he had a hard time with the official academic structures of journal publishing and so forth. The, uh, the, the name Sasquatch actually comes from a Halcomanan uh, language, which is a First Nations uh, language that, that's spoken by many tribes in the Pacific Northwest on the coast there. And it comes from a word Sasquets, which means wild man. All right, back to the image. You see what I did here? That was the final take on it. I did that wash, I laid over the acrylic, and then I teased out some of the details using colored pencil, Prismacolor. The second major theory about Bigfoot is that he's not an ape like Gigantopithecus, but some member of our own family tree. Is there some early hominid, Australopithecus, Homo erectus, Neanderthal? Uh, is there some creature that um, is related to us. And the image I'm showing now comes from the Smithsonian's Hall of Human Origins, and I highly recommend their website. The Smithsonian Hall of Human Origins is a, a wonderful uh, museum exhibit of human evolution, but also they have a fantastic website. Uh, so I would really recommend you visit that interactive site. I was uh, inspired to try to do a drawing then of one of our hominid cousins and the creature that's oftentimes thought to possibly be a Bigfoot is Australopithecine called Paranthropus robustus and Paranthropus robustus is the creature that primatologist John Napier and anthropologist Gordon Strasenberg suggest Bigfoot might be you know in, in the sense that Bigfoot could be an extinct what we think of as an extinct hominid still living in the Americas somewhere. Maybe Paranthropus robustus, that was what their suggestion, possibly Homo heidelbergensis. The downside of this theory is that the, there's really no fossil evidence of these hom hominids ever being in the Americas. So that's a bit of a problem for the theory. Um, nonetheless, you know, in principle, it's kind of a fun theory and I like it. Paranthropus robustus basically was uh, pretty small, like it sounds like it's going to be a giant, but really that just applies to its teeth. It, it, most of these hominids basically are under four feet tall. In fact, Homo sapiens is probably the, the biggest or tallest of, of all of the uh, hominin species. So if we're looking for some kind of human that was much larger in the past, there is no fossil evidence for that. So that, that also is a problem for the theory. Uh, these creatures, uh, Robustus, lived from 2 million years ago to 1.2 million years ago. They probably used tools a little bit. There seems to be some evidence that they did termite um, mound digging. I'm just basically trying to do a, a portrait of this guy uh, looking straight at us. I used pencil to get the basic shapes down and then I'm drawing on kind of a, a wash of medium tone, a gray and uh, with Prismacolor. And now I'm laying in some uh, black acrylic using uh, this sable brush that I really like. That, that brush comes to a really nice point, but also can give you some broad brush strokes. So I'm just looking to create a little atmosphere. We think that this uh, hominid had a very sort of broad pan face, um, given what we know about its teeth, its dentition, and its jaw structures. It probably did not walk upright, uh, but we're not sure. Most of the Australopithecines, I believe, they weren't sort of full-time bipedal creatures. Um, and so I'm basically just, uh, as you can see, I'm going through different versions of what people think that the Bigfoot might be. This is 
the wonderful image of a, a leopard carrying a Paranthropus uh, robustus juvenile up a tree probably. This is from the Didsong Museum in South Africa and many Paranthropus uh, robustus were found in South Africa. Just as leopards will kill other animals and drag them up a tree, probably our ancestors were vict fell victim to this kind of stuff all the time. Um, this is a woodcut that I did. I, I thought I would try to do a woodcut version of the Bigfoot, and I really like the atmospheric way this turned out. You can see the woodcut there, and then this is a printed version. It's very, I think printmakers would be horrified by the, the, the way I broke it up like that. I based it on this wonderful image from what's sometimes called the Patterson footage of the 1960s. And here I did a sort of a drawing version of it and I love the, sp the spooky quality of it, and it's got, it looks like the Patterson Bigfoot, uh, looking back at the viewer, sort of being caught as it passes some uh, loaming sort of greenery. And then I finally decided to, to do a sort of a creepier, more horrifying uh, Bigfoot, much larger perhaps than anybody has really suggested, with a different kind of anatomy, um, sort of like a demonic chimp, and something that's sort of scaring backpackers as they come across it in the middle of the night. In any case, this is me sort of trying to say, well, maybe there was a kind of ape version that, that crossed the Bering Strait and still lives on. It's worth mentioning that the public fascination in Bigfoot really big in the 70s, and in part it's because of this footage that Roger Patterson and Bob Ginlan uh, took. It's just a few seconds of a large, hairy creature. This was 1967 in October, and uh, everyone's seen it. I just showed you an image, a still image of it. There was a lot of, there were a lot of reports and sightings, hundreds of them uh, every year are in Washington State and in California, especially at the El Dorado National Forest. Um, but genetic analysis of hair samples have revealed nothing, <laughs> really, of, of that's compelling or interesting. They turn out to be like uh, bears, or, or there's evidence it's some of the hair is from a cow, some of the hair is from a horse, some from coyote, some from a raccoon. So again, the hard evidence is very, really slim to none. But I do really like the idea, as Jane Goodall confesses, that she's open to the existence of Bigfoots, the big feet. Uh, and she says she's kind of has a romantic view that maybe they exist out there. She hopes they exist, but she she recognizes that the data is pretty incomplete or unconvincing. Here, what I'm doing is I'm going to roll over this Prismacolor pencil drawing with a kind of blue acrylic mixed with a matte medium, and that creates a really wonderful toothy kind of substrate that you can draw into and tease the drawing back out using. Um, Prismacolors and, and, uh, and other kinds of implements. So that's what you see me doing here. I'm mixing that up. I'm going to roll it on with a, with a roller, and it looks like you lose the drawing, but you'll see that I'm able to rescue the drawing back out again. One of the things we have to consider if there is a Bigfoot population in the Pacific Northwest is uh, it can't just be one or two. It has to be a breeding population, because how else could they survive for thousands of years? And that raises this interesting question, this sort of evolutionary question, how big does the breeding population need to be to avoid the issues of inbreeding? And uh, basically primates generally avoid breeding with each other, like kin generally avoid breeding with each other. And that's because they live in these different social patterns like fission and fusion where they come together for breeding and then they separate out as the juveniles grow to become sexually mature, then the females and the males will leave the group and they'll find others in another group and mate with them. And this reduces sort of the problem of inbreeding. That still raises the question, well, how big would the, would the group need to be? And no one's sure, but if you look at other primates, you'll find that, that mountain gorillas, uh, for example, which I was fortunate enough to see in Rwanda, their groups are around 20 members. So that's pretty small. And then the, those are dominated by an alpha male. Uh, and then what happens is when the females get sexually mature, and some of the males too, they leave, they slowly leave the group and find other individuals or groups and mate with them. So you need a couple of pods 
or groups of these Bigfoot uh, operating in order for this to work. And I'm just guessing, you know, that you would probably need at least three of these groups to sort of swap around over time. And so maybe that would put the group, you know, the total number of Bigfoot to being like, I don't know, between 60 at the low end and 100 or, well, really there's no upper limit except I'm, the problem is nobody's seen them. So I'm trying to get as small a group as I can here to make sense from an evolutionary and genetic point of view. So let's imagine that the group is between, say, 60 and 100. Maybe that would work. Let's say they could keep hidden and keep uh, finding each other and procreating and they would occasionally be spotted by the occasional backpacker or somebody around a campfire, but by and large they could survive in this way. That again seems unlikely given the lack of physical evidence, but it's not like saying well they're aliens or they're, they're from another planet or, or anything like that. Alright, here's the final image and I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. I kept it very monochromatic and I love the way it, it's creepy and it's all in a very tight sort of nest of blue colors. And uh, basically that wraps up the tour of Bigfoot. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like this kind of content, hit the subscribe button and come back for more. All right, take care.